which SI constant is best? Like, yeah, they're all useful for different things, but <laughs> let's be honest, they were not created equally. And so today, we'll explore how the SI system works to answer this pressing question, starting right away with the undeniably the best one. Now, you may think that for this chapter about the speed of light, I'll be talking about, you know, light and its speed. But that's actually the least interesting part of the speed of light. The actual reason why it's a constant is the space-time infinity of the universe. I should probably explain. You see, relativity tells you, among other things, that relative velocity changes things. For example, with faster movement, certain things seem flatter, time moves slower, and you need more energy. This is all simple enough, but there is an interesting question to be asked there. What's the speed limit? Like, with no relative speed, there is no time dilation, no length contraction, and no energy required. But if you start accelerating, then all of these things start happening, and is there a point at which time will stop, everything would be flat, and you'd need an infinite energy? Well, the answer is yes. Obviously there is. Just put the maximum number into our equations. The non-obvious thing is the fact that that limit is not infinity. It is, in fact, the speed of light. And so when something is traveling at the speed of light, you can think of it as it traveling with infinite speed. That's because you can think of it as it traveling through a perfectly flat universe with paused time. You can't get really much faster than that, and what's more, you need an infinite amount of energy to accelerate it more. Now yes, what I've explained so far is massively oversimplified relativity, and I'll just add it to the list of videos I'm yet to make, but that is the reason why the speed of light is so amazing. It is basically the infinity of the universe, an absolute constant in S tier. That's pretty good. Next we have the... <clears throat> Unperturbed ground state hyperfine transition frequency of cesium-133 atom. Alright, that's, uh, that's a lot of words, let's clean them up a bit. Amperturb grand state basically translates to no funky business. Hyperfine means different state that an electron can be. Frequency refers to how quickly it's switching between these states and cesium-133 atom just tells you exactly which atom you're dealing with. And the basic idea is that once we specify the exact atom that we're dealing with, we know exactly how many electrons and quarks are there in our atom, meaning that two cesium-133 atoms would have identical properties, meaning that if you give both of them the same amount of energy in the exact same way, they will mostly do the same thing. And in this case, we're mostly interested in it because it allows us to make sure that if we've got the right kind of atom and we use it in the right way, we'll always always get the same oscillation. And after 9,192,631,770 oscillations, a second has passed. Okay, but why wouldn't we just define a second using the speed of light from before? Well, that's because the speed of light gives us the ratio of distance to time. We still need time to, based on that ratio, get the other thing, to get the distance. So, still good. A bit here because it's kind of like the addition to speed of light. It's not quite as elegant, but... Planks. The basic idea is really simple. You see, there is a field of physics called quantum mechanics, which revolves around the idea of quantum. Now, you can think of it as the smallest amount of something you can have, and... I think you can already see where this is going. The entire concept of quanta is minimum amount of something relating to energy. The minimum amount of electromagnetism? Quantum of electromagnetism, of course, or a photon. Electron quantum numbers? Well, they are there to describe electron energy, you know. Black body radiation arriving in discrete packages? Well, that's gotta have planks, he made it. A minimum amount of uncertainty that is impossible to remove? You won't believe what constant is hiding in there. So planks is basically what happens when you need a minimum amount of energy in some way. Energy is a very general thing, and the more you learn about physics, the more you realize that Everything is either energy, equivalent to energy, or made by energy. And so because of that, you can think of Planck's constant as representing the minimum amount of energy. So kind of like a lower boundary for energy, which... It gets funky, I mean, it, it's kind of... The actual equations tell a slightly different story, but it's close enough, we don't need to go into waves. What's more, as I mentioned, Planck constant represents energy. So we can use this equation to define, using the speed of light, and Planck's mass. And so that's why Planck's constant is so important. It gives us mass, it gives us energy, it basically created quantum mechanics solid AT, I do have to say. Next, there is Boltzmann. A bit tricky, but okay, here's the pickle. 
So far, the units we've got are distance, time, mass. From these, you can already make a whole bunch of things, like energy, or pressure, or volume. But let's take a look at those units again. Volume is simple enough. Just length, times length, time length, so meters, cubed, simple. Pressure is a bit more difficult, but basically it's a force over an area. Area is simple enough, just length times length. A force, on the other hand, is a tad more difficult, but it's just mass times acceleration. And acceleration is just length divided by time squared, so there. That is force expressed in terms of base SI unit, which translates to pressure expressed in terms of base SI units. Now let's move on to the big boss, energy. Energy is just mass times distance squared over time squared. And hold on, that's, um, that's kind of like pressure. Except, except we need more length. If, if only we had something we could multiply this by, that would give us the three lengths. And oh, would you look at that? And so yes, pressure times volume equals energy. Now in this case, what's important is the fact that even though we're getting energy, it's still useful to remember that there are different kinds of energies. So let's ponder for a second what kind of energy this is. Oh, I know, it must be thermal energy, because pressure happens due to particles hitting a surface on average, so it only makes sense for this to be thermal energy, or in other words, temperature. And that would actually be a pretty solid guess, I would say. If you, if you thought that's the case, good for you, but there is one thing missing. You see, to us, normal humans, pressure times volume equals temperature makes perfect sense. But temperature, that's a different department. And in that department, there's been unleashed a deadly virus of mathematics. And because of that, this equation actually won't work because of one simple reason. And that is entropy. You see, you can think of temperature as just the average kinetic energy of particles. Really, it'd be fine. But the problem is that average kinetic energy of particles would be different from kinetic energy of particles, precisely because of entropy. So that's why into that equation, we also have to chuck in the Boltzmann constant, which fixes the units and sets the record right. That's why Boltzmann constant is needed. It's for entropy, be it here, because it's actually boring past that, I would say. Ah, elementary charge. And now, considering how quickly I'm releasing these videos recently, I don't think there's a point in stretching anything here. It's just charge of an electron. That's, that's it, you know. Electron has a certain charge and... Eight here! And for candela... Okay, luminous efficiency, so basically how good something is at producing light. So if you have an object emitting light at this specific frequency, then this constant tells you how efficient it is at emitting light. Technically, there is a way to describe it with a function, but whatever, this is SI constants video, not SI functions video. Now, this constant is expressed in terms of candela steradian per watt. Why? Well, it's because if this light source emits a lot of light, then it's better at emitting light. It's divided by watts because if something is getting a lot of power to emit the same light, then it's not actually all that efficient at emitting light. And it's multiplied by steradian because you don't actually care how much light there is, only how much light there is in any given direction. Now, the upsetting thing is that this isn't actually measuring how much light there is, only how much, like, visible light there is. So uh, that's kind of... Ah, whatever, no one cares about this CTF. After that, Avogadro. And Avogadro is rough. You see, explaining it always takes a long time, and that's because it's a constant for a unit that's not really a unit. So, okay, mole. If you have a mole of something, like a mole of carbon atoms, then that just means a bunch of atoms. This many, to be exact. And like, there is already a whole bunch of things I could say about this. Isn't that just a number representing quantity? Aren't the carbon atoms that are an actual unit? Would a mole of meters be different from a unit of meters? Isn't it just like a dozen? And what's more, if a dozen is rescaled mole, wouldn't that also be a base? But I won't get into them right here, right now, because I'd like a simple, distilled, and clarified view into why mole sucks as a unit. And so to do that, let's talk about the ideal gas law. So there are many ways you can express the ideal gas law, but today we're mostly focused on these two. Now right here we have, in order, amount of substance of a gas expressed in moles, the gas constant expressed as joule per kelvin mole, the temperature in kelvin is equal to the number of particles of a gas, which is dimensionless, times Boltzmann, which is joules per kelvin, and temperature at the end. The reason why it's important that I break down everything like that is because 
now we can start matching them. So Maul cancels out the Maul, Kelvin cancels out the Kelvin, Kelvin cancels out the Kelvin, and we can remove the one because it's multiplying by one is just the same thing, and there. Now you can see that once solved, this equation says that the drool is equal to a drool, which is correct. However, what I'd like to focus on is that in order for this equation to work, we need n to not be equal to n. Or in other words, these two have to be different things, otherwise the ideal gas law doesn't hold. But that shouldn't be tough, I mean, n is just moles, so the amount of substance. That's simple. Capital N in this case is the number of particles, so number of molecules or atoms depending on the gas. Okay, um, one problem however, <laughs> you see, uh, what is the amount of substance? Like, what does it actually actually mean? Um, well, don't worry, I'm just going to check up on the NIST.gov, National Institute of Standards and Technology. I think it's a fine source if you're looking for a, for a, for a standard. Um, so, <clears throat> oh, it's a measure of the number of specified elementary entities, which can be an atom, molecule, ion, whatever. So basically, it's the um, number of molecules or atoms. So basically... To simplify, uh, number of molecules or atoms is measured in moles, and number of molecules or atoms is not measured in moles. And both of these statements have to be true, otherwise this equation isn't correct. So, F tier, I would rank it higher if it wasn't there for such a garbage unit. And yes, there is one unit left, but before we get to it, it's time for the thinking segment. So thank you to my beloved patrons for helping me make these videos, for supporting me, because without the support, I would not be able to do what I do. See, recently, I finally reached a point where I'm, this has actually become sustainable for me, where I can actually do YouTube full-time, and that would not be possible without my patrons. Thank you so much. Special thanks to Acronymous, Useless, Quasa, and Lakebear for supporting me, the highest patron tier, and just... Thank you all so much. Um, Positron, as always, for the lovely art of me fighting him over the mole, because mole is not a unit. Also, Ovo, I don't know if I, I... I don't remember actually adding this art in the past videos, and that's just rude of me. So thank you so much, Ovo, for the art as well. Also, I have a Discord server uh, where we chat, we have fun. I stream every single day. Uh, so I have a good idea. Hear me out. What if for the... I stream every single day, I just add in like the recording of this stream right now where I'm editing this video. It might be a bit confusing, but I think it could be collecting money for charity. Right now we're collecting money for charity, Prevent Cancer Foundation. It's a lot of fun. I would really recommend. And so there, that's the end of the thanking segment. And now we can finally get to the Steradian, which in my opinion, should be the actual 7th base SI unit. Steradian is defined as meters by meters, which technically means dimensionless, but if you want to convert from candela to lumens, you need the Steradian. Expressed in base SI unit, it still includes the Steradian, which begs the question, why is mole in the base SI, why aren't radians? But that's just... That's just my thing. This is so inconsistent. I'm just so dumb. And for now, I suppose that'll be it. Thank you, everyone, so much for watching, and have a great day. Bye.